Thanks both for your talks. Um, I just started asking a question to the group uh, concerning kind of what the philosophy is on interdisciplinary research um, in, in your program. So you talk specifically about the T-based model of interdisciplinary training, but are you coming to it with the philosophy that faculty have expertise that they will use to train students in interdisciplinary work or that this is kind of um, in a way like a, what do they call it in tech? Like a, a place where new, new ideas and, and innovations will emerge. So the T proposes a capstone approach, right? But there might be more of a cornerstone approach where new questions are emerging because you have um, essentially undisciplined students coming in early to their program asking questions that evaded the spaces filled by conventional disciplinary knowledge. <laughs> says says that's a good question. <laughs> I think I, I think then she looked at me. Um, yeah, so that that's that's good. so I guess our um, idea was that so we have this team in Arrow Ecology that's been working together um, now for uh, eight or nine years, and so most of the faculty who would be advising those students are associated with that group. Um, and so they would get their training in meteorology, let's say, um, but they would also sort of be part of that, that bigger group. And there are, so there are some larger group projects that go on there, and, and members of their advisory committees would be um, in, in other disciplines. Um, and so in part, we, don't, um, we haven't done a lot of training of faculty, let's say, like officially, like interdisciplinarity um, of our faculty. But we do have a core group that are interested in, in cross-disciplinary work and have invested their time and effort uh, for, a, for a long time in that group. And so tho those are the faculty that we're primarily thinking would be the advisors of this, and they are the advisors of the, of the students, um, particularly those students who are on fellowships. We've had students come into the certificate program um, who are advised by faculty members outside of the group. Um, and, but those students typically have not moved on to the, the fellowship program where it supports their research. Um, but it, in a lot of ways, those students are, are open to explore whatever research topics um, occur to them. And some of them have gone off into things that, we, that hadn't occurred to us um, ahead of time. I don't know if that answers your question or if you had another sort of angle. Got table eight. Um, so both of you um, had briefly mentioned um, recruitment, um, and I was kind of wondering. We were kind of talking at the table of um, how have you maximized um, increasing diversity in your recruitment? You want to take that? Sure. Um, so I, I would say that the, the main thing that we try to do is, is again, um, uh, well, there's a couple of things. Uh, on, the, on the access side, we go talk to a lot of students, um, and we try to make sure that we talk to a wide diversity of student organizations, a wide diversity of departments. Um, we correspond with a lot of students. So most of the students we contact don't end up in our program, um, but we try to m uh, message that the program is inclusive and, and really we don't have a lot of existing uh, requirements. So the data analytics, which is it, it, one of our courses, uh, we're very intentional that that starts at, a, that's a zero entry course, right? So if you can show up to the course as a graduate student, um, you ought to be able to, uh, to complete the course, right? So it's not like you need to be programming when you come in the door. Um, and so keeping a low uh, sort of uh, barrier to entry is, is one of the things uh, that we do. And the other piece is just around retention. Uh, so once we get the students into the, the courses, um, to try to be very aware of the stress they're under. between, And it's typically the stress between um, 
first year graduate students in some cases um, because they're entering graduate school and it's not at all what they thought it was going to be, uh, which seems like a common phenomenon. Um, they're getting a very different message from their home department than they are from the, uh, the NRT environment and that creates some stress for them. Um, and, and then there's just the, um, the stress around um, am I making sufficient progress, the imposter syndrome. Uh, sort of bailiwick of things. And so just being um, uh, proactive around those conversations has helped us with, um, with retention, right? And having multiple team members available so that people who identify um, are more comfortable talking to different people aren't sort of stuck talking to me, right? Uh, you know, so that we have a lot, and we make sure that they're connected with a number of the, the different team members. But those are the things that we do um, but we don't sort of have, like, um, other than those, have sort of large programmatic elements. I, I can so, um, one of the things we accepted from the get-go was, before in our team, our, our core group of faculty members, we had two GANs, one after the other. So we had a GAN in 2012, I was the PI, we had another GAN. If you, do, if you don't know what GAN is, it's a graduate assistantship in areas of national need. It's funded by the Department of Education. Um, so we, we had this group of uh, faculty brewing over the years, since 2012. Um, one of the things we, we accepted and established early on during the GAN days, which carried over uh, to NRT as well, was the fact that recruitment is everybody's responsibility. So it's, it's students' responsibility, it's faculty's responsibility. So, I, so, so we, we put the, I don't want to use the word burden, but burden of identifying um, diverse, diverse group of students on the faculty. So faculty will pick up the phone, call all of their colleagues around the country, will send emails. Um, I have access to, say, five different listservs based on my personal, um, personal work and professional connections, right, the societal email list. But faculty might have, like, collectively, all of us coming together, we might be able to distribute advertisement to 30 different uh, mail lists and, and have access to a, a much broader uh, a population of students. So that's what we did. We, we, we mobilized all of our faculty. And then once we started recruiting students, we, re we started to mobilize our students. Our students will bring their girlfriends and boyfriends to the program, <laughs> seriously. Um, and so, so, so those were, th that was the uniform recruitment plan. And then in addition to it, we had a very systematic recruitment person, Stephen, uh, was in charge of recruitment. And um, every time somebody applied to Clemson University graduate program, master's or PhD, they will automatically get uh, our brochures mailed. <laughs> I know we work with the graduate school on that one. The, one of the associate, actually both of the associate deans are really good friends. So they pulled us a favor and, uh, and, and we, we don't, they can't share the information of the students with us, but they, they shared our material with the students who applied to Clemson. So, um, so we didn't want to have anyone who is uh, interested in this general area applying to Clemson without knowing about this opportunity. And then we have a, a built-in system in our proposal that we are going to start this year. Is uh, We're going to have a cohort of faculty members and students traveling to nearby HBCUs. Uh, because we are in South Carolina, I mean, you are in North Carolina, not too different. But in South Carolina, we have access to a large number of HBCUs in our region. Uh, we, we wanted to make sure we were, um, we were um, taking advantage of that proximity, so we're going to actually drive and present our program. And I give a lot of hugs to people, so that, that really goes a long way. Uh, from a retention point of view, um, we, have, um, we have about six women students in our program right now, and every one of them I personally interact with, and I'm very, you know, I, I'm, I'm very close with all of them. Um, and sometimes we oca occasionally we take like all women pictures, and it's just kind of a little awkward, but we, we do it. Um, so, and, and we have a number of um, African-American students. We d but, but the problem is we don't have an African-American faculty member right now in our program. So that's a little bit of a, you know, we have a little bit of a mismatch there, but we're, we're, working, on, we're working on that. Um, we, we do, th the social network analysis, I think, our, our biggest um, source or help in that it allows us to see if our students are connected or not, because as long as the students are connected, chances are they're going to retain in the program. So we pay close attention to every, every semester we are looking at. I mean, we are, we are very new. We just you know, had our first cohort one. We don't call them cohorts, actually. We don't call our students cohorts. But we just had our first year under our belt. Um, so we only had two rounds of data so far. But we're going to keep looking at the data and see how students are st remain connected with each other. Bring the hammer down in a certain way here because we need to stay on time. So let's take one more question. And uh, the second thing is we'll reconvene at 3.20 and 3.10, instead of 3.10 as was originally scheduled, and that should get us close to back on track. So um, 
Does anyone have a burning question? I'm just going to kind of open it up. <laughs> Pro probably against my better judgment. But. Oh, you want to One of the issues that came up was, oh, we don't publish in those journals. So within recruitment of faculty, um, have you guys at the various institutions on regard to promotion and tenure, has that been an issue that you've had to s sort of wrestle with in order to get participation in the program? I, I, okay, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna take that. So um, Vanniva writing our proposal. What, so um, there's someone called, um, Laura, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna fail the last name. Co what is Colin's last name from University of Maryland? Linguist Phillips. Thank you. Colin Phillips is a wonderful individual um, from University of Maryland. He he is a he is a PI of he used to be a PI of an iGuard. Now he's a PI of an NRT. Uh, I've never met him. I, I met him recently. Uh, he was my hero. He, on his website, he shared every NRT proposal related documents. And when we, when we were writing ours, I saw his example. Um, institutional support letters and there was a stipulation about TPR and and that was that was interesting because I will study what Colin has done and then I will just beef it up and then modify it for Clemson so that, that was that was a great great starting point for me but as soon as I saw that it just triggered the whole you know series of reactions in my brain then I put a lot of stipulations we're going to make sure our faculty members will be rewarded for interdisciplinary work and if they're co-advising students they're going to so I mean I, I kind of beefed it up strongly and I and in that institutional support letter I had um, the deans the provost, the vice president for research, chief financial office, uh, chief information officer. I think I had like everyone that mattered in terms of the TPR chain uh, and, and the university's executive administration signed that letter. Um, and and I, I shared that document with all of our junior faculty members saying, hey, look, the, the university gave their word to us that by participating in this, you should not be heard. And the department heads were informed about the fact that they need to be extra mindful of their junior faculty members. So. We are just we are just starting to get the publications out, and it's um, we have we have about five math students in our program, and I'm I'm also in the process of learning that in math sciences the average number of authors per paper is 1.9, and um, in some other sciences in more like bioscience it's just much higher. So there are cultural differences, right? Uh, so we, we are very mindful. We keep asking our faculty members, "Will you get credit for publishing in this journal? Otherwise, maybe we take those results and publish in yours." So we, we, we have this constant dialogue going on. And one last thing, I know I'm talking too much. I'm sorry, Zach. But one last thing is. Um, we have a very intentional built-in faculty development program in our project Be because, and I got this from credit goes to Richard Tan Kersley who, um, because he met with me one time for 30 minutes and it turned out to be a two and a half uh, hour conversation at NSF when, when we were writing our NRT proposal. And he told me that um, the reason that we were switching from IGO to NRT was the, was the the NRT now has the expectation that you're gonna make a change, just like what Laura was saying, it's a catalyst, you're gonna make a change at your institution. And how else can you change your institution other than changing your faculty, right? Of course, policies and procedures, but if you change your faculty, then that will last, because students come and go, faculty stays. So we have a very intentional effort on uh, faculty development and faculty mentorship. And, and um, we, so some of the ex projects that we did, faculty, like this introductory course, faculty came and sat just because they were curious and they wanted to learn. Um, and we have uh, faculty brown bag luncheons, faculty development seminars. So we have, we have a series of activities on that as well.